from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. A rebound in semiconductor stocks has many investors asking if this is a harbinger of good news for the broader enterprise tech sector. Indeed, the Sox Semiconductor Index is up nearly 30% year to date, as are leading indicators in that group like Applied Materials and LAM Research. But Nvidia is up over 90% year to date and AMD up over 50%. Even the beleaguered Intel is up 22% year to date as of midday on the last trading day in March. But key enterprise software names have not yet rebounded. And according to today's guest, the divergence between semis and B2B software is getting hard to ignore. Hello and welcome to this week's Wikibon Cube Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we examine the bifurcation between the performance of semis and broader enterprise tech. And we try, we'll try to answer the question, is the performance of semiconductors an early indicator of a broader enterprise tech recovery, or is this a false signal that warrants continued caution? To examine these issues, issues we welcome back Ivana Delevska, who's the founder and chief investment officer of Spear Invest. Ivana, welcome back to the program. Great to see you. Thanks for having me, Dave. Okay, before we get into today's premise, when you last came on in September of 2021, we talked about your strategy of buying the dip for Coupa, Snowflake, and Zscaler. And that strategy worked great for a few months until the market shifted. Have you changed courses? I mean, you're outperforming those names in the past year. How would you characterize your current strategy in this market? Well, we haven't really changed courses. What we try to do throughout a downturn is keep adding risk slowly. So we've just kept adding to these names with the expectation that once the market settles, these are pretty high quality names, they will outperform. So similarly with the semi stocks, we kept adding throughout the downturn. Nvidia became one of our largest positions. And, and as the market rebounded for semis, which are usually early cycle, that's been uh, been helpful to our uh, to our portfolio. Okay, thanks for that. So, I mean, what caught my attention is you, you posted on LinkedIn and, and have, ex have expectations for enterprise spend finally reset semis versus B2B software. Really, you know, well done piece. Thanks for sharing that. So I really want to get into it. Um, so in that note, you showed this chart, which is pretty self-explanatory. You have Nvidia, AMD, and the SOC significantly outperforming uh, two names that you watch closely, Snowflake and Zscaler. I believe you still own both of those. And no, we've inserted a chart of the SOX ETF just in the upper left to show how cyclical semiconductors are and have been for years. Sometimes we forget about that, but please share your premise of your recent research. That's right, David. So you're, you're spot on in terms of the cyclicality of semis. Usually semiconductors are, are sold through the channel. So that's why you see these wild swings. Basically what ends up happening is the companies themselves have very limited visibility while the channel has a lot of inventory. So once you see small deterioration in demand, you're going to see an exacerbated impact to this company's revenue numbers. So going into the second quarter of 2022, we saw pretty significant downside, 40, 50% in terms of revenue declines in some segments for the semiconductors. And as we're coming out of it, we're seeing the opposite dynamic happen, right? So you're seeing the market stabilize, but the channel inventories are pretty low. So as those stabilize and need to be rebuilt, you're going to see an uptick in demand. So let's stay on semis for a minute. Uh, obviously open AI and generative models have exploded onto the scene. I wonder how, if you could comment how you see AI in large language models supporting the semiconductor resurgence. I mean, I, I love ChatGPT. On the one hand, it's making me a better writer. On the other hand, I run some stuff and it gives me back complete junk. So, but I have this sort of love hate with it, but you've got all this innovation driving semiconductor demand. EVs have twice the semiconductor content as conventional vehicles. You got geopolitical forces driving investment like the CHIPS Act, and this is a global trend. As semis peaked toward the end of 2021, is this a cyclical rebound in your view, or do you think it's a false positive? So semis usually have a cyclical and a secular component. So the secular component hasn't really changed since two years ago, or even since five years ago. As we need more compute power, we need more hardware on the back end. So it's a pretty simple, simple thesis. 
we believe that at this point in time, there is a cyclical upturn and the secular drivers are kicking in pretty strong driven by AI. So we believe AI will be a pretty significant driver. And a lot of people are asking, well, is this just a hype and is it really showing into numbers? And the answer is yes, it is already showing into numbers. And you can see that NVIDIA's data center segment is outperforming other data center, that other data center spend. So we are already seeing it not as strong as to justify the stock price move just yet, right? So we, we do need to see a few more quarters of improving data center demand, but we are already seeing the early benefits of, of AI in NVIDIA's numbers. Yeah, so you own NVIDIA, obviously. Do you own, do you own Broadcom? We don't own Broadcom. We disclose all of our holdings on our website, just FYI, if people right. wanna, wanna check it out. Yeah, okay, so but uh, other names that you like, that you, that you own, that you're sort of adding to over, over the, the downturn, uh, other than NVIDIA? So the, the last name that we added to is AMD. It's another um, semiconductor manufacturer. We believe that as demand grows, NVIDIA is going to still remain with a market leading position, but the supply is going to get so tight. It's all, we're already seeing from many companies, even Microsoft is having to prioritize their AI uh, usage and projects that they're going to allocate compute power to. So we believe there is going to be broader benefit to GPU uh, manufacturers. So we like AMD as well in the same space. I, I don't know now, if in terms of new. Oh, please go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. In terms of new capital added, I believe this enterprise spend and the effect that it's had on, on some of these this companies, especially in attractive areas like cybersecurity, cloud infrastructure, a lot of these names are still trading at their low. So in terms of new capital, I think those are the areas that, that we would look to, uh, to add. And that's what I want to talk about next, I don't, but I don't know if you saw, I just wanted to tell the audience. So this week, uh, the CTO of NVIDIA came out and said, he kind of poo-pooed crypto, even though they've made a lot of money on crypto and said they had been prioritizing uh, supply for AI, at, potentially at the expense of, of crypto. So that was kind of an interesting little tidbit um, that I saw this week. That's right. So a lot of people don't know this about NVIDIA, but they really made a big push into AI as of five plus years ago. So really what the development has been is not only on the chip side and the GPUs, but they developed this CUDA architecture, which on top of it has a lot of free frameworks that people can use and really easily build on them, build project, build, build functions, uh, and all of that is free and is available if you purchase NVIDIA's hardware. So that kind of gives them a pretty good mode here. And I think that's correct. They have been prioritizing this um, AI investments in order to capture the market early and develop use cases even. Okay, so now let's get to your next point. So one of the factors that's suppressing enterprise tech is cloud. Here's a chart that underscores that, that trend. You, you actually just published this. It's actually a tweet from ETR, which shows the change in net score. Net score is a measure of spending momentum. The blue line is quarter to quarter cloud sp spend. And the orange line is the change in overall survey net score across about 1400 or so organizations. So cloud has essentially dragged down the entire industry because cloud spend is much, a much higher proportion of tech spend today than it was, let's say, during the big downturn in 2008, 2009. The hyperscalers today, the big four, probably account for about $200 billion annually. And back during the mortgage crisis, that, that figure was a rounding error. And because cloud is so much easier to not only dial up, but you can dial it down, cloud optimization has created a downdraft, really pulled down enterprise tech. Now, Ivana, you're po you point out in your piece that Secular trends such as AI and accelerated computing with GPUs are driving demand. You just talked about that. Uh, we just talked about NVIDIA's you know, CTO. Um, so explain why you see AI as a catalyst for overall enterprise demand. So interestingly, AI requires a lot of data. And what we believe is going to end up happening is that people are going to really the compute power is going to become really expensive, right? So it's really going to be all about optimizing how you're doing the processes, where you're running the processes. So we really like companies like Snowflake, for example, 
that will help you choose where you want to run the compute, where you want to do the storage. So we believe it's same thing with cybersecurity, right? As you uh, introduce AI, especially in real world applications, like if you're remote monitoring uh, a refinery or, or you're doing predictive maintenance or, on some of these large real world assets, cybersecurity is going to become crucial, right? So uh, we believe these are really strong long-term drivers for both of these segments. And you don't really hear the CEOs talk about these trends on, on their conference call just because it's a little too early to see it reflected in the numbers. But there is no question that this is going to be a long-term driver. So the other thing I want to share, you, you put some data in your piece, uh, this chart right here in your post. It shows the 2023 forecast for the hyperscalers as a group growing at 20%. That I got them at 21%, so very consistent there. Snowflake at 40%. Uh, all the high flyers, Cloudflare, CrowdStrike, et cetera, all the way down the list, averaging out at 28%, so lower expectations uh, relative to 2020 and 2021. But there's still some momentum in these names. For example, we saw this with CrowdStrike last earnings report, Palo Alto Networks as well, is not shown on that chart, but in a surprise to the upside. I mean, even Cisco <laughs> beat and raised. So it's mixed. I guess my question is how much upside is there in this data? Uh, because you have easier compares, you've got conservative guidance. Is there sandbagging going on, do you think? What, and what are the catalysts for a rebound in your view? Well, we believe there is absolutely some level of conservatism built into these numbers. Enterprise spend, a lot of it is driven by sentiment, right? So if people are feeling good at the companies, they're going to decide to budget more for next year. If they're scared about the economy, they're not going to budget as much, right? So it's unlike same is where it's driven by real demand. Like if people are buying GPUs, you're going to see it in the numbers. Enterprise spend is a lot more sentiment driven. So at the moment you saw some weakness in the economy, CEOs, um, and CTOs started cutting their budget. So we believe there is some level of conservatism in these numbers. The bigger shock looking at that table is that a lot of these hyper growth companies with really interesting products are starting to show growth rates close to the cloud vendors, right? Which doesn't quite make sense. So we have a lot of mature companies as well that we're following and growing at 20%, Plus, it's really not that difficult if you have an innovative product. So I think that not only that these numbers are conservative, but the real problem here is that when people look at 20, 25% growth, is that going to be then stepping down to 15 and then down, down to 10? Because that's a big problem, right? So that's kind of what you're having priced into the stocks today. Or is that going to be something that we are seeing one year of weakness and then it resumes in the 30s uh, in terms of percentages. So that's the big delta, I think, between the bears and the bulls today, right? Like if you think this is the new level of growth and these hyper growth names grow at 20%, no, you can't even justify the valuations today, right? But if you believe this is a cyclical downturn, which is the camp that we are in and they can get back to a more normalized level of growth, then they look very attractive here. Let me follow up on that because you got, I mean, Amazon, AWS is now, I don't know, 80, $90 billion company, you know, growing at, you know, 20%. Azure's growing faster, Google's growing faster. But if you go back, Google, if you compare Google where they are today versus where Amazon was at this side, Amazon was growing much faster. So it's very possible that, 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 that growth could accelerate there, but such, such a large numbers. Do you, do you think the hyperscalers can actually accelerate growth? I mean, Microsoft has just cut the line from a business model perspective with generative AI. Uh, what do you think? Do you think we could see an accelerated growth amongst hyperscalers even, the big ones? So we are a little less cautious on the hyperscalers, but there is no question that this is a cyclical downturn, right? So I think a lot of investors, what they missed about hyperscalers is that their business model is in a way taking risk away from the consumers and onto their balance sheet, right? So you are supposed to be seeing a slow, cyclical slowdown because people do reduce consumption. So it's almost like the business model itself, the value proposition that they have for, for their customers is that they can scale up and scale down. So 
I do believe that we're going to see a cyclical reacceleration from these levels. I don't think we're going to see 40, 50 percent growth, which I think some of the other names that are coming from smaller bases and smaller scale, I think they could return to, to those types of levels of growth. Yeah, and you'll probably see a, a, a Databricks at some point go public. They, they, you know, from all accounts are growing, you know, very, very rapidly. So that's going to be one to watch. Um, what about security? The sector's up year to date, uh, but some names like Zscaler are lagging. They kind of reverted to the mean and then started, you know, moving again. You, but you got CrowdStrike and Palo Alto. We talked about those surprising to the upside. Security remains the number one priority of technology departments and, and zero trust is becoming a watch phrase that increasingly has meaning to companies. So do you think security could help lead the rebound in, in enterprise software more broadly? I don't know about leading the rebound, but I do absolutely believe that we're going to return to, to more rapid growth. Basically the big problem right now that we hear from our companies is that they're having trouble getting new customer to sign new customers to sign on. So this is why you see platforms like Palo Alto and CrowdStrike outperform because they already have a pretty large installed base of customers that they can upsell products to rather than having to go out there and find new logos where a lot of the weakness is. Okay, so last data slide I, I want to share, Ivana. Uh, I got permission from ETR to show this data. It's preliminary from the very latest ETR quarterly uh, sir, uh, T TSIS, Technology Spending Intention Survey. It's still in the field, but it's almost complete. I mean, I'd say it's 90% there. And this is part of their macro drill, drill down, which tracks expected spending from IT decision makers each quarter, ITDMs we call them. Coming into January, 2023, the expectation from these folks is, as you can see on the far right set of bars was for 4.6% increases in spend in 2023. That's the blue bar. That's now down to 3.7%. And the buyers have changed quite a bit in terms of techniques they're using to cut. Typically it's been consolidating redundant vendors and optimizing cloud costs. Those were the top two. But Ivana, it looks like they've kind of squeezed that lemon pretty hard. And now they're accelerating other techniques. I can't share the specific data until ETR releases, but it's, but delaying or canceling new projects is now number one, cutting staff and reducing hardware spend and sp spending less on consultants is right up there. It, it, they all take precedence over consolidating redu redundant vendors. So what this tells me is that we still have a ways to go because if buyers are canceling projects and cutting staff, to restart them is going to take a little bit of time and the cloud makes it easier, I know. And the narrative seems to have shifted from, you know, digital transformation is our priority and future to do more with less. That's sort of back in vogue. What do you think about How confident are you of this tech rebound? Are you pulling, it sounds like you're pulling the trigger now cautiously, uh, adding, you know, risk you know, as the market goes down. How are you thinking about this in the next three to six months? Well, I do think a lot of this data is based on companies which are still pretty cautious, right? So it's a lot, a lot of it is sentiment driven. It's going to be very different industry by industry. I just met with over 50 industrial companies with pretty broad um, end markets and subsectors ranging from aerospace, housing, broad industrials, mining, um, and that, that's all those end markets are doing really well, right? So all of those companies are going to now reaccelerate spending, even though they were cautious maybe three months ago. So I think it's going to really depend industry by industry. Banks obviously are now in focus and are not doing well. So a lot of people are asking, well, is that really the next shoot to drop here, right? For companies like Snowflake, banking uh, and financial services uh, industry is a pretty big and market, but I do believe it all goes back to the economy. And if you start seeing the consumer doing a little better and industrial economy reaccelerating, there is, all of these other sectors will just have to follow. So we do quite a bit of channel checks to get a framework of where things stand. And things are actually a lot more optimistic than what you hear on, uh, on TV. Okay, so the customers, you're right, it's kind of a, a, a lagging indicator in a way. Um, and, and last week, 
uh, Ivana, we published, our audience knows, we published uh, which tech firms are most exposed to the banking crisis. Snowflake wasn't overly exposed. They were kind of, you know, middling. Databricks was exposed, but in a very positive way. It shocked us. The, the ETR net score for Databricks in financial services was off the charts high. It was, it was amazing. Um, so you know, obviously we're keeping an eye on, on that, but I, I want to end with the areas that you see as providing potential upside. And we've listed them on this chart. Th this is from your, your post. Platforms beat point products. Uh, you know, tech companies are getting more disciplined and that could drive operating leverage if and when revenue growth accelerates and, and prioritizing must haves over nice haves. So I want to unpack these a little bit, Ivana, starting with platforms. I mean, these aren't really mutually exclusive. My guess is you're looking for companies that sort of fit in all three, but explain your thinking here. Uh, and maybe we can talk at the end about which names you think will, uh, will benefit. Maybe start you know, at the top. Yeah, sounds great. So basically these are trends that we're seeing already today. Uh, and companies like CrowdStrike, we would consider them as a platform where basically the company started as an endpoint leader they gained pretty significant market share. So they got to a point where if you analyze it, you're like, where, where is the upside going to come from? Well, now they've expanded into several different areas that could be providing pretty significant total addressable market expansion. And they're, in addition, expanding to small and medium businesses. They just announced a partnership with Dell where you can have CrowdStrike available when you purchase your computer, which is a pretty big deal. So it's really all about finding products where they can um, use the same infrastructure and sell more products and more, more services. Great, okay, and then the second point on, on that slide is cost cutting by tech vendors, you feel it hasn't fully kicked in yet. Um, and and I, you made a comment about those that cut less than 10% and more than 10%. Um, the more than 10% could have been a warning sign, although you said it could have been a strategic move. Uh, you mentioned Meta uh, and some others. And so there's, there's a potential uh, silver lining there, but, but maybe you could talk to, to the second point. Well, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great point. Basically, there is a bifurcation. If somebody is cutting 10% of cost of, of workforce, it usually means that their products are still working, demand is still there, they're just optimizing. So that's usually like the area that you'd want to focus on because you can get some pretty low hanging fruit. And even as the market continues to recover, they will continue to benefit from the great products that they have. So HubSpot is an example here. They really are not seeing, obviously seeing some slowness compared to, to history, but they're still growing at pretty attractive rates. So now, once they optimize their cost structure over time, that's going to be pretty uh, meaningful for margins. Where we are more cautious on are companies that are cutting more than 20% of their workforce. And this is usually a sign of something really bad going on, right? Like you're either thought you had a business, but that business is no longer viable, right? So here you can still find some good opportunities if somebody is able to to turn around what they're doing. And Meta is, I think, one that could fall into this category. We are not involved, uh, but you could see them maybe able to successfully transition to a lower cost structure. But it is a red flag for many others like Upstart or um, Open Door also had a pretty big, pretty big uh, late workforce cut. Carvana, I think, was also as well over 10%. Over In these cases, there may be a business model challenge, right? And you don't want to be stuck with these uh, ideas where you get a pop in the first year, right? When they actually do show margin improvement, but if the business model is not there, how are you going to generate the returns in the long term? So we prefer to stick to the ones that are we consider to be quality, and the cost cut just enables them to have a efficient uh, operating model going forward. Great, thank you. And then and let's talk about the must-haves versus the, the nice-to-haves, the third point on this chart. Um, I was on a call with a, a, a CIO of a very large company yesterday, and she said, look, we always have a priority list. And then what we do in situations like this is we pull from the bottom. 
And we take resources from the bottom and we throw them at, at the top. And you know, very, very practical, but you know, maybe you could double click on uh, must haves versus nice to haves. I think you're spot on, you summarized it pretty well. Basically cybersecurity is an area that is a must have. So even if you push out a project or you split it into different pieces, eventually you're going to have to do it. Similar with, with cloud spending. Optimization, yes, pretty meaningful, significant negative driver to results, but there is only so much you can do. So those areas also are very difficult to cut beyond just optimizing. But there are a lot of small tools that are supposed to be improving productivity that are not in that must-have scam, right? So they do need to prove out their business model and maybe they're not going to get a chance in this type of a, of a market. So a lot of um, this we see in, uh, in DevOps, basically where you're providing useful tools, but the question is, does the CEO really understand what the ROI on that is? And is there even an ROI, right? Some of them may not really be offering um, the productivity improvement that you that you think you're you're getting. So we do prefer the must haves. I think that's a really good way to manage risk, right? Where these companies are still going to provide a lot of upside if the market turns, but in the meantime, they do generate free cash flow and they do fall into this more defensive camp. Yeah. So cybersecurity. I mean, analytics. You mentioned Snowflake would be would be good examples. You're saying. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I want to close by asking you what the risks are to the scenario. I mean, you have the banking crisis, a you know, looming liquidity crunch. Uh, could the semis you know, potentially retrace 10 to 20% given the big run up? Uh, are, are they extended? You know, uh, is chasing the broader tech fool's gold at this point? Uh, you know, all these things. I, I, CrowdStrike, you know, big, big uh, quarter in small business. If you got a liquidity crunch and rising interest rates, does that hurt small business and, and hurt them? How are you looking at the risks here in the next say six months you know, or so? Well, you're spot on. The biggest risk or something we're closely watching is small businesses. Because if you see a liquidity crunch, that's where you're going to see it. Large enterprises, interestingly, like a lot of the large companies I met with over the past, um, over the past week, they're not having any cash flow problems. So liquidity wasn't even uh, a question for companies like Airbus, Boeing, a lot of the large industrial. So if you do see weakness from the liquidity problem, it is going to be uh, in the small businesses. However, one thing I would say is that the real liquidity crunch, in my opinion, happened a year ago, right? So that's when you saw rates going from close to zero to 4% plus. So a lot of this negativity or a lot of the downside has already been priced into uh, demand and the market. So that's why we are a little bit more optimistic than most here. And we don't think that the liquidity problem is going to be as big as, as people think. That's it, that's Semis, it. yes, they've run up. They could easily pull back 10%. 10, uh, 10 the fundamentals for semi are pretty strong because the next leg up could be China. China has been just demolished. I don't think people realize the impact that that's had on semis. Basically, if you look at TSMC, China has, went, has gone from 20% of the business to a little over 10%. So basically China demand is cut in half. So as China recovers, and this is one of the things we learned um, from, from the conference I just attended, it sounded like the China recovery is going a little better. So this is the driver that we look for for semi specifically that we think are gonna is gonna drive the next uh, the next leg up. But yeah, for sure, ten to twenty percent easily they can pull back at any time from this level given the the volatility in the market. And yeah. I'd say the biggest risk, sorry to interrupt you, the biggest risk that we see is just the recovery being more muted than most other recoveries we've seen because you still are going to have high rates. So there is not going to be booming demand. Um, and that's something that people should uh, should keep in mind. Yeah, it could take some time uh, to come back. But but I think I, I like you, and a long-term optimist. I think generative AI could be a huge catalyst. You know, when we saw it, it was like a, a Netscape moment to us. All right, Ivana, we got to leave it there. I want to thank you so much 
Ivana Del, Del Vesca for coming on theCUBE, uh, Spear Invest, you've got great insights and you do your homework. I really appreciate your contribution to this episode. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks to Alex Meyerson who's on production. He manages the podcast. Ken Schiffman as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight, they help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our editor in chief over at Silicon Angle, does some great work for us. Remember all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on wikibon.com and siliconangle.com. Don't forget to check out all the videos, thecube.net, or you can email me directly, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on LinkedIn. And please do check out etr.ai. They got great survey data. They keep it up to date. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.